after all these great talks about uh, the chemistry of life or the chemistry before life, um, I'm going to, I feel kind of out of, I feel like a fish out of the water because I'm going to talk about evolutionary dynamics from an organismal approach. And what an organismal approach is, is kind of the main point of my talk. Uh, and the reason is that we understand a lot of the material basis of life. Uh, what we even look for biosignatures as the detection of oxygen, or methane, or many other molecules. But then this, all these ingredients of life uh, should be arranged in a specific manner in order to have uh, life in a system point of view. And we don't have a theory for that. Uh, but it is important because uh, when we study life or evolution, we are referring to organisms. We're referring to specific entities. And this is uh, quite nicely related to what happened in math with Kurt Gödel, uh, who basically solved the debate with David Hilbert by saying that we cannot forget that number theory is about numbers. And then in biology, more or less, we have the same equivalence with uh, Nicolas Rashevsky and uh, Rosen, who said biology is about organisms. So the problem was that back then, and we still quite don't know what an organism is, but we practice biology uh, counting organisms, counting genes in organisms, in cells, in bacterium, in yeast, like we do in our lab. Uh, but we don't quite yet know what is an organism. And if we go somewhere, outside Earth, and including Earth, and try to, to describe life or living systems, we're faced with a lot of problems, and we need a set of tools that we still lack, or are very primitive. Irreversible thermodynamics, information theory, self-organization, emergence, historical contingency, what is a novelty, non-ergodic systems, uh, autonomy, what is a function, and then a theory of organisms that we don't have. And that's the point of the talk. Uh, this is more or less what Schrodinger was thinking when he said we need new physics, but we still don't have it as uh, a generally accepted theory. So if we go and search for life, we might find three cases, three general cases, I would say. Uh, that there's a planet with no life, there's a planet with life, and there's a planet with post-life, I would call it. So then a problem is the origins, how it did it emerge? Uh, then extinction that we're not as interested, but it might be a fundamental process as well. Uh, and certainly it's happening in Earth at some level. Uh, but if we do find life, then our best approach to study life is evolution, evolutionary dynamics. And we all know that. We have this dictum in our brain, and so nothing in biology makes sense if it is not uh, in the light of evolution. But evolutionary theory itself has its own history, and it is quite detailed. But uh, there are some uh, major ab advances in this theory that are exactly 100 years old since uh, Ronald Fisher, who was the first who formally mathematized most of what we think of as population genetics. So uh, one of our main arguments is that all of this, uh, the equations and everything, is it is not that they're bad math or at all. It is just that they're not referring to organisms yet. So the theory of evolution is more or less like 100 years of solitude, not just because the 100 years, but because there are two people at the top who have so much effect in all of our community as a, as a group of scientists. And these two people in science will be Newton and Darwin. So what these two people wanted to give us is scientific happiness because uh, happy is who is able to know the causes of things. And this, someone said this 2,000 years ago. Uh, so how do we know the causes of things? Well, you have a system, a natural system, then you build a formal system that has some assumptions, internal assumptions, and then you dec decode back to the natural system and then say, okay, my formal system is uh, giving me predictions or useful uh, knowledge about the natural system. 
So the main framework currently is just that you have a given some initial conditions, and then you have some law, and then uh, you have boundary conditions, and then that law will pre pre predict what's going to happen. And that's the contemporary view of physics in very general terms. So if you know what's going to happen here at this level of atoms, then you know what's going to happen in molecules, and so on and so forth, until you can explain a social cultural uh, systems. So that's a very gross simplification, but it is a huge debate currently in, in physics, and this is what is called uh, upward causation. You have uh, subatomic particles that have some causal effects on atomic level, and then if you see all of the arrows are pointing upwards. But then, very recently, and it is not a couple of years, uh, this debate has been going for decades, we have uh, George Ellis that says, Consortium can happen at, uh, at both uh, directions of this tree. And we have evidence of this. And we have evidence in biology about this. Uh, they wrote a, a great book called From Matter to Life, uh, trading this, uh, this problem. So one example, and there's many examples, but one example is that the structure dictates function in many biological systems. And natural selection acts at this level, and therefore it selects out some molecular components that are not as good or as fit. And there are historical components in biology, historical contingency, and there's so much evidence about this in experimental populations, experimental evolution. And that's why uh, Harold Morowitz said that biology is between history and physics. And that's why we cannot really understand very well. So we're privileged, but also we're in trouble because historical processes are very hard to just explain with entailing laws and uh, physics alone. So biology is somewhere there in the middle. This is a figure modified by, from Morowitz's original paper. And the only uh, framework that we have to explain order or uh, emergent properties one of the main uh, frameworks is just statistical mechanics that reduces order to a single scalar value. But we as biologists have the intuition that you cannot just reduce an organization at a higher level to a scalar value. So, and the causes of things can be explained uh, basically in a simple uh, framework that's thousands of years old. If you have a material cause, an efficient cause, and a formal cause, the material cause is just kind of the ingredients if you want to make a cake. Uh, the efficient cause will be the process of transforming these ingredients, and the K will be the formal cause of the outcome of this process. Uh, for example, this is a simple example, but in evolution, we know that the, we can also frame uh, the problem in these three causes by saying that uh, the material cause is individuals in a population, the efficient cause are the actual changes of uh, rates of survival, differential fitness, and then the outcome is a new generation of individuals. Then you can start over again, and, and so on and so forth. So what's evolution about? So that's, again, the question is about individuals, but individuals are not just single particles or scalar, uh, scalars. Individuals are organisms. And I guess that's a problem that we put, uh, we, the physicists are not to blame that the call is around it because we do make calls our own, our own way. We have these particles that are going to a bottleneck, and then we count these particles as either genes, phenotypic traits, or any other particle that we can identify. And then from these particles that are abstracted from the organism, we make predictions. But we know that uh, that's problematic, because if uh, the fitness of trait tokens is not independent of the organism where these tokens are. So that's why many other people have been debating that is organism fitness what is important and not the, just the trait fitness. And we know this, if you have different mutations in different genetic backgrounds, then the phenotype will be different, not as the wild type, but is context dependent. So the same happens with game theory and many other approaches in evolutionary biology, that you have particles that are competing or doing something. You have a payoff matrix, and then you solve the equations, and then you get the dynamics. But you're, again, abstracting the organism. And this is the practice, the current practice. We have these tokens, and they interact some way, and then we get the dynamics. So 
The proposal is just very simple and really not really revolutionary, but it sounds strange for some people if we're not thinking about this all the time, is that we need to take into account the organisms and the environment. It's a very simple proposal. So our proposal is having a system, OE, O being the focal organism, E being the environmental field, which is just all the things that are not organisms, and the other organisms. And do we need a concept for organisms? I think we do, and this is a great review by Matt Heron, where he basically concludes that we do need a, a theory of organisms, and then other papers have been trying to explain what an organism is, including this that is not very uh, sophisticated and physicists will criticize because the axes have no values all, at all. But there are recent, and also the environment is not considered, as I mentioned, even though so we are trying to design minimal bacterial genomes, but I will ask this uh, in these studies, what is the environment? So are you providing with everything that this bacteria needs? It's a minimal media, blah, 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 plus temperature. So then the synthesis is very simple. We have the organism, we have the environment in the environment can be another, other organisms, but this, still the question was, what is an organism? Well, there's this paper in 2015 that is promising to be a very good definition of organism. And it's very simple. Just take in your organism of preference all the constraints that are present. For instance, an enzyme is constraining a reaction. And you can represent this uh, in a formal way. And then you can chain different, different processes that have constraints on each other process, but then you still have kind of loose ends. So the, the problem is then to close it. And this happens spontaneously in many uh, systems. Uh, emerging, it's an emergent property that sometimes a constraint will close the system. And then just to not draw all of the arrows and all of the symbols, we can just represent this as a graph that is a closed graph. You can reach any other node from any, from any, any node. So then there are other organisms that are also interacting. And even though this looks complicated, it's the same principle. Some organisms can have some constraints in other organisms. And what we're proposing also is that we need to map the fitness. We, it's not sufficient to just uh, design the organism, but to map the fitness into a functional uh, by a Darwinian individual. So how do we do that? Is just we, as, we assign uh, some parts, some constraints are just metabolic constraints. Some other constraints are involved in reproduction and the whole system is the organism. If you don't have reproduction, but you can, you have organization, then you are not a Darwinian organism. Reproduction also has to be a heritable variation, as we know. And different organisms can cooperate and form new entities. So then the entire system of these two organisms is what is closed. And then what is a function here? A function is just each of the constraints that participate in the system. So now this is purely theoretical, but we can model this because there are many frameworks that we can use from network theory and from uh, individual base models. And before we didn't have the concept of organisms, but now we do, now we have it. So that's what we are gonna uh, show uh, that are just preliminary results. And what we're gonna have is in the individual base model where the individual is an organism defined as a closure of constraints. And we're gonna call individual processes, H processes, you have an organism that interacts with the environment. You have the three Aristotelian causes. And after you have uh, uh, the outcome of this process, you can have a path. And this path, if you have a population, then every individual has its own path. And the entire population will have a pathscape, not a landscape, because we don't know the entire space. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what will happen. So just uh, this is a diagram to show the synthesis of the framework that we have the tools already well developed by many other people. Uh, individual based models, spatial models, or fitness mapping is something that we can also uh, put in the computer, run in the computer, run populations in the computer, and do 
again, as I said, individual based models, but each individual now is an organism that interacts with the environment. So that's it. I'm just going to thank all these people. Take any questions? I won't toss it to you. Okay, so um, the, at one point you mentioned that um, biologists, uh, they would, the mindset would be to rebel against the idea of trying to represent a, like a network of creatures as as a scalar quantity mm. but in a way isn't that what the like representation of an organism is it's it's just a scalar quantity in the vast web of life as it were i mean you could possibly encode a network structure and the states of the of the network in a scalar value but that's not uh, what we usually do in uh, statistical mechanics you just have different arrangements of a system probably you can encode it but uh, and that's not the fundamental thing. The fundamental thing is the description itself of the organism not being uh, described as a particle, but as a system, because life is a system proper. So you think that statistical modeling is like the, sorry. That's okay, I, I, I apologize. We, we do need to take this offline. Um, can we thank our speaker again? And we'll move on to our next speaker. Thank you.